the uh, Raksha, the magazine of CPDR in the 80s, she used to send us dispatches from Neogi CMMS right since those days, but I met her only recently. And uh, she's been active in the women's movement from the 80s right up to now, and now heads the women's studies department in uh, Varanda Mahatma Gandhi University. Uh, she is a scholar and a human rights activist. I think I'll speak from here. First of all, I want to thank you all very much. I want to thank the people of Mumbai for being with us through this very traumatic period that maybe I referred to and that we all know that has lasted all of four years and I don't know if it's going to last for how many more years. To all our friends for uh, sheltering our daughters because uh, when this hit us, uh, both our daughters came to Mumbai, which I think continues to be, despite whatever has happened, continues to be one of the most progressive cities in India. And I'm also particularly grateful to the group, the artists here, who have today, through this exhibition and through this uh, panel discussion, and what we're going to see after this, the Dastan Goy, Dastan Institution, given us a completely different way to look at this whole issue of freedom of speech and expression, of breaks on such freedoms, of rights and of uh, the violation of rights, uh, of the way in which we conceive of our nation, of our citizenship, and uh, the way in which at least certain elements in the state would like to define these things. When I went to the exhibition this morning, I was really struck by uh, the, the feeling that one had of a constriction of spaces. I mean, Tushar had, of course, constricted himself into a very small space, which was uh, reminiscent and evocative of a prison cell, a person who is in solitary confinement, who has no access to, um, to other people, who has no resources except his own resources on which he has to survive this period. And if he's lucky, he will come out. If he's not, he will not. Uh, but all the other experts, there were cages, there was uh, green moss engulfing the walls. Uh, there were videos from Kashmir, I think one that was um, uh, Assam, Manipur. Uh, so uh, the entire thing, I mean, it gave such a graphic uh, sense of a constriction of spaces and that is something that, uh, you know, I mean, even as I sit here in Bombay today and I speak to this group which I know is with us, uh, of the kind of constriction that I, I still feel. I have felt for, for, for the last four years and that I still feel when I go back to Chhattisgarh because there it is a, it's a very different ball game. 2007 when uh, Binayak was arrested, the newspapers, the headlines that hit Raipur, 14th of December, 15th of December, 16th, and I think for the next few months. Suddenly the entire, it was as if our entire history of engagement with Chhattisgarh had been wiped out. Uh, we have been there since 1981. Binay and later I, we both worked with the Chhattisgarh Mind Shramik Sen. Jyoti was referring to this period when she said that uh, with uh, Shankar Guhan Yogi's movement, I worked particularly with the women. But uh, at that time, uh, Aditya Raksha was coming out. So we would regularly send updates about the worker struggles, the struggles of women, and whatever was happening in the trade union front. And that was one of the most vibrant trade unions that I have, that has ever existed actually, that I have been very fortunate to have been associated with. Uh, the kind of, um, you know, the emotional spaces. And it was, a, you know, I mean, being with that trade union, working in Chhattisgarh, at that time gave a feeling of increased spaces, of opportunities, of dreaming of a world that was very different, in which there was equity, in which there was equality, in which people supported each other, people gave strength to each other. And that is something that having lived through that, to live through this Chhattisgarh in which headlines are proclaiming that uh, Vinay Sen is a uh, Naxali Dakia, his entire history is forgotten. Uh, 
पुलिस को लंबे समय से तलाश थी विनायक की how we the way in which we use our language because uh, hindi as you i mean those of us who speak hindi hindi is a it's a gendered language it is also a hierarchical language in the sense that people that we respect we address as ve unne kaha unhone kaha and people that we do not respect are uh, usne kaha usne bola so overnight the night is transformed from a respectable person into a disreputable person so he becomes who Uh, उसके घर से ये पाया गया उसके uh, उसके बारे में कहा जाता है उसके पड़ोसियों ने कहा कि उनके घरों में स्ट्रेंज एलिगेशन वन एलिगेशन वॉज दैट मेनी यंग पीपल वुड कम टू देयर हाउस एंड वुड स्पेंड लॉन्ग आवर्स देयर विच न्यूज पेपर रिपोर्ट विच मैंट दैट ऑब्वियसली दे एट देयर सो वेर इज दाइंड मनी टू फीड सो मेनी पीपल so this was a ridiculous thing i mean you know something that i always thought was positive that you know our friends would drop in and you would ask them to stay over for lunch or stay for dinner that becomes a crime uh, the judge the lawyer start accusing start addressing you as tum uh, everybody says tum i mean you uh, if a person is in the dock you cannot say up so these strange things you know about the way we treat people the way we use language i mean this i began to find out in 2007 and i'm still learning i still i know i have a lot to learn but uh, the idea in uh, you know the way in which spaces just collapse and the way in which uh, it was just somehow struggling for breath just somehow struggling for breathe and uh, struggling is struggling to breathe struggling to keep your head above water this has all really come home to me in the last 4 years there was a similar exhibition and a similar event in delhi uh, just before the bail hearing in uh, i think in the month of april early early april and that was also a brilliant event and uh, both these events the one in bombay and the one in delhi i think i feel that artists have a lot to contribute and they have access to a different because we people like us we read we write we argue we talk uh, we of course understand issues in a certain way and are able to express it in a certain way but i think artists have a great contribution to make in the way in which they conceptualize issues and in the way in which they are able to put it across to a much larger public and uh, you know make them see finer nuances that we are uh, really quite unable to express so i'm uh, very grateful to the uh, people here who organized and put this event together to share and all the others I want to say something about I mean this is it has been a very traumatic experience of course because uh, obviously you can understand the family was completely disrupted and in this uh, very hostile hysteric hysteria, hysteria that was whipped up in Chhattisgarh uh, Chhattisgarh is of course uh, I mean the state is uh, by its own definition it is coping with a Maoist problem and in the process uh, really not having a lot of success on the ground so they would like to pinpoint any soft target and uh, you know i mean banayak is of course today according to the the media in chhattisgarh is to be believed is the mastermind of the naxalites he is uh, uh, he heads the urban network and uh, things like that <laughs> so he's really a very dangerous person i mean i'm sorry that i didn't discover all this before <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway that being that uh, it has been a very traumatic period but it has also been a period of great learning and it has been a period of um, i think uh, i have also learned i mean a i have i mean the case has intellectually challenged me all all these four years in the way in which the, the you know understanding the arguments understanding the sedition law what many said and what many spoke about the sedition law is absolutely correct but i think reading beneath the lines um, below the script actually the sedition law is about challenging the sovereignty of the state because that is the way that the british of course the language that is used is that anybody who excites disaffection and uh, but anybody who actually questions the sovereignty of the state is liable to be seditious and in pre independence times the armed uh, might of the state the police the judicial system also they used regularly these laws to curb the voice of uh, those who are asking for india's freedom today it is the same machinery that continues on the ground the government has changed we now have a constitution uh, our constitution does guarantee us 
many freedoms and it is our, I believe, our right and our duty to fight for those freedoms, to continue to exercise our demands for them when we feel they are being violated. But at the same time, on the ground, the machinery remains the same. It is the same police force. I don't know whether ever in 1947 or in 1950 there was any orientation program conducted for our police personnel that, okay, times have changed, the government has changed, the ethos of the system is different, so you are supposed to behave differently. I don't think that ever happened because they behave exactly in the way I think that they behaved prior to that, prior to 1947. So anybody today who raises any questions about the state is immediately seditious and uh, of course there is this uh, very dangerous concept of the seditious meeting which I have also learned today <laughs> and, uh, I, I think we are all engaging in one, to, uh, one just now so we have to be careful uh, I have also learned through this whole period that uh, you know the fact that in 2007, when all this started, very few people and few of our friends, uh, comrades like Jyoti, the word comrade, by the way, is also not a good yes. word because in the course in, in the course in Chhattisgarh, it was argued that anybody who uses the comrade, uh, the word comrade, is of course a Maoist and of course seditious. This was part of the public prosecutor's arguments. <laughs> Uh, so, anyway, our comrades like Jyoti, I mean, uh, they have known a little bit about our work area through the women's movement, we have been connected. But I think a large number of people did not know and did not understand. And when these very, uh, you know, sort of mighty sounding charges were pressed, a uh, large number of people, large number of ordinary people who did not know about, know about the Nayak or did not know about us, did not know about the situation in Chhattisgarh, did not know about the Sarva Juru, really somewhere believe that, you know, there must be something there. Huh? There is no smoke without fire. Uh, so in 2007, it was very difficult to talk to people to convince them that, uh, I remember when I tried first for my daughter's admission in a college in Mumbai, um, uh, one question that was asked, not to me, but to Sanova, who was negotiating for her admission, is that uh, why is the mother coming and where is the father? So she said the father is in jail. So the reaction was, oh, the father is in jail? What for? So <laughs> anyway, I mean, it was explained. And uh, I mean, ultimately, the college was very, very supportive. But I'm just saying that a lot of people really believe that there had to be some something that was you know, wrong, something that was not there. So the idea that the state can really go after somebody and uh, prosecute without any rhyme, without any reason, and really be malevolent and really be vicious and vengeful, that is something that I find a lot of people, it took me a long time to figure this out, that the state can, because I, I can understand this because I have felt it in my own life. But otherwise, to understand this vicious nature of the state, I think it is, uh, many people find it difficult, but it is true, unfortunately, that when the state chooses to go after somebody, it will use all its power, it will use all its strength, it will use all its machinery, all its weaponry, and they have many more weapons. The state has much more armor, arsenal than any of us. But I have also learned that it was through the actions of ordinary people, our friends, and the growing number of friends who believe that, who have elements of doubt and who believe that something was wrong, who week after week, month after month, year after year, went on the streets, went on uh, writing pamphlets, went on uh, talking to people, organizing events. That slowly this mass of public opinion built up and in 2010, when the conviction actually took place, then suddenly I found that the mood had changed. People really felt that something horrible had happened. The mood had not changed in Chhattisgarh because the government that set out to teach a lesson for uh, questioning the Salva Jurum, because the Salva Jurum was really the flagship program of that state, uh, a program in which uh, vigilantes were created, a program in which large numbers of Adivasis were displaced. Uh, suspicious correlation between the displacement of Adivasi villages who were supposed to be pro-Maoist and the giving of the licenses and contracts to industrial houses for mining. Uh, but I have no proof, of course, that you know the villages were displaced for that reason. But there is really a suspicious correlation, strong correlation between the two. But uh, anybody who questioned this and ultimately anybody who questioned the model of development that was coming, because we in Chhattisgarh had 
we have worked for 30 years and we have worked with workers' organizations, Adivasis, and uh, the people had really a very different vision of development, which was far removed from um, big industries, heavy industries, very energy intensive industries. Uh, but when the new state was created, the obvious uh, thing that came to the mind of our rulers was that you must create a Chhattisgarh which is uh, going to have all those things, going to have heavy industry. And even today, our political leaders in Chhattisgarh keep saying that we will turn Raipur into Singapore. Because Singapore, of course, being the epitome of a uh, you know, well-designed city and a uh, you know, very advanced capital of something. So this uh, kind of contradiction between the two visions of development, that is really something, you know, that is, some, uh, I mean, that I think really underlines a lot of the, you know, a lot of the problems that we are facing today, people like us are facing. But I want to say that in 2010, when this happened, the mood had completely changed and somewhere, I think, large numbers of people, even I started getting letters prior to 2009 when Manak had been in jail before going to prison, uh, there would be a large number of people writing to him because I think once he told me, and he can supplement this, that uh, where the rest of the jail got in a day some six letters, all the other prisoners, and this is a large prison, uh, Binay got in one day something like 400 letters over Christmas of 2008. Uh, but in 2010, I started getting letters because you know people from small places, people from Sangli, people from Sholapur, uh, people from um, uh, Karnataka would be writing postcards to me, would be sending me letters and saying that you know you keep you just hang on there, we are with you. Asa nahi chal sakta, asa kabhi nahi hoga. So I felt that you know, and this is what I want to end with. I felt that somewhere. I think people at last begin to understand that we cannot abandon our agency. We cannot abandon our freedom to speak. We cannot abandon, even if whatever our differences are, I think there is enough space. This is a large country. This is a strong nation. Why should we, why should we be afraid? Why should our rulers be afraid? I don't understand why our rulers are afraid. But there is no reason for fear. We have so much space. We can all talk. We can all say what we want to say. And when we feel that those in power, which means our political leaders and our bureaucracy who are so drunk with power that they cannot tolerate any dissent. When we feel that this is happening, when we see that this is happening, then we decide to take matters in our own hands and it is really a very large, the nice case of course using that as an index case, there was a huge uh, campaign that was built up, that was national, that was local, that was village level, that was city level, that was chalk based that was international, that was in many cities, and where people really said that, you know, the those in power cannot really force us to abandon our agency, and we feel that this has not been right, and ultimately, uh, relief did come, whatever relief has come, I mean, the case will still go on for years, but at least the fact that he is out and his civil liberties have been restored to some extent, I think whatever relief has come has been because of the way in which people have stood together and the way in which people have reasserted their rights to politics. Politics had tended to go out of many people's lives and we really, I mean, once we go into elections, we elect people and we put them there and then everything is handed over to them. And of course, they would like it in that way. They are very happy that once a year they come to the voters and they get them blankets, saris, whatever, whatever, and then they get elected and for five years nobody bothers them. But I think through this case we have collectively realized that this is not the way that it can be. We have asserted our power. And this assertion of people's power, I think this is something that I have learned. You know, when I went to, some time ago, before when I got bail, I went to Lucknow at the invitation of, a, of an NGO that used to work with uh, women victims of domestic violence. And uh, they, by definition, because they were working on the TV Act, they worked closely with the police. So for the program, they had invited me to speak and uh, to uh, release a book that they had brought out on the, on the occasion. And they had also invited some senior police officers of Uttar Pradesh, of Lucknow, to come and be there. Not a single police officer turned up. So somewhere midway through the program, the organizers got a little nervous and they phoned the IG and the DIGs and whoever they had called. And the reply they got was shocking. The reply was that, you know, we cannot come to a program in which Elena Sen is present. So they were 
bit crestfallen. But I was very happy because I suddenly realized that, you know, I mean, I had no idea that I had so much power. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> my being at a program can actually, the IG stays away because I am there. And if I have power, it is actually the power of all the people who have been with me and all the people who have taken the right stand, who have taken the stand that we have a right to dissent. Vinay Sen did visit Narayan Sanyal 33 times, yes. He knew that Narayan Sanyal was alleged to be a Maoist, yes. But he also believed that Narayan Sanyal had fundamental rights, including rights to prison visits, including rights to help, which is why he visited him. And if my understanding is different from that of Dr. Raman Singh, so what? I have a right to my understanding. Dr. Raman Singh can have a right to it. I want to end here. I want to end with the fact that our newfound strength, I think we are just beginning to rediscover our political strength and our politics is too serious to be left to our politicians. So let us reclaim our spaces. When I was preparing for this, uh, whatever 15 minutes I had to moderate with all these giants around, <laughs> I just came to one conclusion that sedition is really spreading knowledge of things which people don't know. I mean, the government can do away with armed, with organized opposition to it, to organize resistance to its policies or organize resistance to, uh, to it used to be the landlords. And no one comes to know about it because that happens in the remote areas. And if at all anything comes out, it's only the police version which comes out, which blames the victim as the aggressor. But once people start spreading the knowledge that really of what is really happening, then that's when the government starts getting scared. That's when dissent really becomes too dangerous. And from the government point of view, I can understand that without endorsing it. Because when I read uh, the report on Salva Guru, which uh, Dr. Binayaksen brought out with the uh, the help of other civil liberty organizations, I think in 2006. Uh, even after being a journalist for so many years and editing a civil liberties magazine which used to publish horror stories as a rule, it was just devastated me reading that report that the government can actually do such a thing to its own people was something which I just couldn't accept even after so many years. And that is really sedition. When people start thinking that this is what really our government is, then you just can't help feeling that it's hateful, contemptible, and needs to be brought down. Anyway, you all must be wanting to hear Vinayak's sense, so <laughs> I'm not going to introduce this. <laughs>